Hi everyone, welcome to the talk and thank you for your interest in this topic. My name is Tintin Gong Kangwei, a PhD student at Purdue University. So the discussion we bring here today is an incentive issue in proof of work based public blockchains when transaction fees become the major incentive. This means that when a miner mines a new block, his expected returns from this block now not only depends on his mining power, which determines his probability of finding this block, but also depends on the contents, like what transactions are included and how many fees are attached to those transactions by the users. So in this new transaction fee-based incentive setting, there is a new debate in mining strategy called undercutting. In this work, we explore its profitability and also take steps towards overcoming this undercutting problem. This is joint work with Dr. Minai, Professor Sun, Professor Kate. Let me first give you some motivation behind studying this undercutting problem. The first and foremost reason is because a proper incentive scheme is very important for proof of work based public blockchains. They are essentially decentralized systems. So we Proper incentive scheme helps the system attract more honest miners to invest computation resources so that the system can potentially enjoy honest majority. With honest majority, the system can provide better security and performance guarantees. So theoretically speaking, under honest majority and assuming network synchrony, based on time for tolerant consensus is possible with proof of work. And practically speaking, with honest majority, attacks like double spending are harder to carry out. In terms of performance, if the system has more honest miners, then it can provide liveness with higher probability. The second reason we study the undercounting problem is because transaction fees can become the major incentive for Bitcoin, and in this new setting, undercutting is practical. Undercutting is not a good thing because it hurts honest miners. Okay, so let me first explain why transaction fees can become the major incentive. So for Bitcoin, currently there are two sources of incentive the fixed new block generation reward and the time overround transaction fees. So the new block generation reward halves every 210,000 blocks to cap the total Bitcoin supply. So it's currently 6.25 Bitcoin and by 2060 it's going to be 0 0.006. So in the future, the transaction fees are going to be the major if not the only sources of incentive. So in this new future transaction fee based incentive setting, the attacks and defenses in the current fixed block generation reward based incentive setting still apply with necessary adaptations like including timings into the attacks. On top of this, we have a new challenge, which is undercutting. So undercutting is essentially forking by taking advantage of the fact that rewards come from fees and fees are time variant. So undercutting means to fork and leave out more fees un unclaimed compared with the forking target, the victim block. So the behavior of leaving out more fees is only meaningful if we have two assumptions. First, we have dishonest miners. Second, these unclaimed fees are attractive to those dishonest miners. Okay, so in Carlson et al. 2016, where they proposed this undercutting attack, they made these two assumptions in a slightly different manner. First, they assumed there exist petty compliant miners who are mostly honest, but they break ties in favor of the chain that leaves on more fees unclaimed. Second, miners can claim all the accumulated fees. This will definitely make the extra unclaimed amount attractive because you can claim them all. Another assumption is a fixed fee accumulation rate. So let's look at an example to build up the intuition why undercutting can be profitable. I'll adjust the blocks in the system by their height. So BH-1 is a block at height H-1. Okay, we will treat this block as the common parent, nobody undercuts it. So after some time, some fees are accumulated, some miner finds block BH, which becomes a current chain header at time T1. The undercutter does not own this block, so he's considering uh, undercutting it. The petty compliant miners will continue working on the main chain, because they are mostly honest, they just have dishonest tie-breaking rules. Okay, with some probability, this undercutter finds the competing block BH prime, IT2 before the main chain extends. Okay, he will definitely leave out more fees unclaimed. So let's do a simple analysis. So if the undercut does not undercut, he will receive zero from the pile because he does not own block BH, right? And the owner claims everything. If he does undercut, he will receive some non-zero amount because he will succeed with non-zero probability. And if for the petty compliant miners, if they shift to the fork, they will have more to claim because remember they can claim all the accumulated fees. But um, one caveat here is that the petty compliant miners, when they shift, they should have this in mind. If they extend the fork, the undercutter can still undercut them. Another caveat is that miners usually do not claim all the fees either because there exist a block size limit or because miners control their block size for faster transmission, verification, etc. 
So in this setting with block size limit, petty combined behaviors may not be profitable because you cannot include the extra amount of fees without kicking out some other transactions. Further, this means that always undercutting may not be profitable because sometimes nobody joins you. Okay, so to model this undercutting strategy or attack more realistically, we assume miners are either honest or rational. So for rational miners, they can fork, they can undercut, they can shift the mount chains to maximize their profits. And we assume there exists a block size element, which will give an upper bound for the claimable fees at each timestamp and we allow for arbitrary fee arrival. Let's look at the same example. So suppose the owner of BH now claims 6 of the 10 tokens accumulated and leaves out 4 because of the block size limit, and the undercutter is considering undercutting it, and the remaining rational miners are doing their thing, they can be undercutting as well, they can extend the main chain. So with some probability, this undercutter extends first and creates the competing block BH prime. He claims 4 of the tokens and leaves out uh, 6, because 2 accumulated during the process, then it has 8 tokens on the fork, and the main chain has 6 tokens. Let's do the simple analysis again. If the undercutter does not undercut, he will expect to receive some amount X from the 10 token pile, and with probability 1, this chain becomes main chain because nobody undercuts. If he does undercut, he will expect to reach, um, get some amount Y from the pile, and with probability P, which is more than 1, the fork becomes main chain eventually. And for the remaining rational miners, if they do not shift, they can expect some amount, and the original main chain with probability 1 minus P becomes a eventually main chain. And if they do shift, like they can expect some amount D, and with probability P, this fork becomes a main chain eventually. So by comparing these amounts, we can decide for the rational miners whether to shift or not, whether to undercut or not. But this is very simple analysis because the remaining rational miners can undercut the undercutter. A more refined question to ask is how many fees should an undercutter claim in the first block on the fork to achieve the following goals simultaneously? First, to attract other rational miners to join the fork if necessary and avoid being undercut by others. A further question is, can others make it not possible for this for the undercut to do this? If this is the case, then we have a defense strategy. So in this work, we answer these two questions and make these three contributions. First, we provide codes from conditions for profitable undercutting. So if there are limited fees remaining, then the undercutter can just fork. If there are sufficient amount of fees remaining, then, then the undercutter needs to undercut properly to leave um, a proper amount of fees to attract rational miners and also avoid being undercut again. We parameterize the attack duration with a safe margin parameter, which we'll discuss later. And second, we provide a defense strategy, which is essentially an alternative transaction selection rule, and we show that this applying this defense strategy is an actual equilibrium. This means that a miner does not want to unilaterally deviate from this defense strategy. But we also note that if there is a discrepancy between the mining power of the strongest undercutter and the second strongest undercutter, then the strongest undercutter has an advantage over others even in equilibrium. We capture this advantage by a concept called the price of anarchy. And finally, we show that this defense strategy is very easy to deploy and only requiring light changes to code bases. Finally, we complement the analysis with experiments with real-world Bitcoin and Monero data and also artificial transactions to test the profitability of undercutting and also a strong attacker's advantage to the price of anarchy. Let's first model the undercutting strategy as a game. Let's first look at the players, their types, actions, and utility functions. So we have M miners in the system, M1 through Mn, and they are either rational or honest. After labeling them, we can calculate the total honest mining power beta H h for honest, and then the undercutter will have mining power beta u, u for undercutting, and the remaining flexible rational miner will have mining power beta r, r for remaining rational. So the actions available to the rational miners are undercutting, shifting, or staying on the current chain. Okay, so the utility functions are, are just calculated as the total fees minus the mining cost. So in this work, we focus on maximizing the total fees received. Okay, so how do we calculate the fees then? because we don't have a fixed accumulation rate, right? So fees will arrive with transactions. So given a block size limit, and given a pending transaction set, we can scoop out some of the transactions, right? According to this size limit. So we define the set that gives you the most transaction fee total to be the bandwidth set. 
So Benoissat is not necessarily unique, but this maximum claim both fees are going to be unique. So in this example, assuming the box size limit is 400 with the units, the bandwidth set can be 153, 152, 134, 124, but the maximum claim for fees is unique, is 31,000. After seeing the players, let's zoom out to see the system. Upon a new block generation event, we will take a snapshot of the system and represent it as a vector. We have a naming convention here that the chain 0 is going to be the chain that extends the common parent the focal point first. Let's look at an example to see each element in the state vector. H0, H1 are the relative heights of chain 0 and chain 1, so at time t1, when BH appeared, but BH prime hasn't appeared yet, H0 equals 1, H1 equals 0, meaning that chain 0 has 1 block, chain 1 has 0 block. F0, F1 are chain 0 and chain 1's free total vectors inside blocks. So delta is the mining power shifting from a source chain to a destination chain. We intentionally make a positive if the shifting is from chain 0 to chain 1. Okay, time t2, so if the remaining rational minus shifted to the fork, then delta will equal to beta r, remaining rational. And O is just mining power on chain 1. At time t2, if the remaining rational minus shifted, then O will equal to beta u plus beta r. The state transition is also very straightforward. A pound new block generation event, whichever chain is extended by 1, then you just add to the relative height. Then we calculate the shift, which is essentially making a decision for the remaining flexible rational minus which chain to stay on. Then after calculating delta, we can update O to be O plus delta. Remember, delta can be the positive or negative. We parameterize the game termination with a safe margin parameter D. So this means that the rational minor will move to the chain that is at least D blocks ahead. So there is some subtlety when D equals 1 and the undercut is starting an attack, but we won't go into detail there. For honest minus D always equals 1, we, won't, we don't care too much about it. So how about we just model it as a mark of decision, process, and solve it. So the difficulty here is that we currently don't include pending transactions set in the state. So because miners can do arbitrary transaction selection, so there will be different reward for, different, for the same state transitions, and we didn't capture this, but if we do include pending transactions in the state, there will be too many transaction selections to solve for at each time step, and it's not generally interpretable. And the state now not only depends on rational minor choices, but also depends on the user's actions. Now let's go back to square one. What we wanted to do is to compute and maximize the expected returns for the rational minors, right? So we think the undercutter wants to pick a proper time to undercut, and the remaining rational minors wants to decide wisely which chain to stay on. So what's ideal for the undercutter would be the undercutter expects some event to happen after he undercuts and he ex expects to earn extra profits if this event actually happens. And after he undercuts, this event actually happens and he actually earns extra profits. This is ideal for the undercutter. So there is a discrepancy here. The undercutting decision is made before undercutting and the timing assessment is made after the fact. The implication here is that undercutting may not be implemented ideally because you don't know all the future events, but let's first put ourselves into the undercutter's shoes and decide whether to undercut or not. So suppose at time t1 we see a minor extending chain 0 and the fee total inside this block is 1. We intentionally make this 1 to measure everything relative to it for general interpretability. So the undercutter is considering undercutting now, so he will be measuring all the future events. He will claim amount A in the first block on chain 1, and minus can claim amount gamma in the second block on chain 0. So this gamma is the fee total in the bandwidth set, which means it's the maximum claimable fees. Okay? He will claim some other amount in the second block on chain 1. So the factor returns from extending chain 0 is going to be beta u times gamma. The expected returns from undercutting would be this quantity, so the leading term in the yellow box is the probability of chain 1 winning, which we'll talk about how to calculate. So here the 1 and the quantity in the red box is the probability of the undercutter owning the corresponding block. Okay, so because the outer miners are going to be shifting to the fork after the fork peak become visible, then the miner does not own the second block on chain 1 definitely. So now let's look at probability of chain 1 winning. In this uh, state transition graph, we have the abbreviated states. So we only capture the relative heights of the chain. So okay, 1, 0 mean chain 0 has 1 block and chain 1 has 0 block. With probability beta u, it will be transitioned to 1, 1. 
and with probability beta u plus delta, we will be transitioned to a terminal state because d equals, for d equals to one case, everybody will move to the chain that is one block ahead. So the probability of one winning is just the product of the transition probabilities on this path beta u times beta u plus delta. So by comparing those expected returns from not undercutting and from undercutting, we can arrive at a condition for profitable undercutting. When gamma is smaller than delta a plus beta u divided by one minus beta u, then the undercutter should undercut, otherwise the undercutter should just extend chain zero. So delta here is the shift. A is the amount of fees to claim in the first block on chain one. So gamma is the fee total in the bandwidth set. Additionally, we can separate two cases. If there are limited fees left, so if gamma is very small, it's smaller than beta u divided by one minus beta u, then the undercutter should just undercut without even considering attracting other rational miners. The intuition is that there are so few fees left, you are better off just by undercutting. Otherwise, the undercutter needs to decide the amount of fees claim on the in the first block and chain one wisely to attract the proper shift to delta. Because now we are considering the shift, we will need to put ourselves into the rush remaining flexible Russian managed shoes as well to decide whether to shift. So here the gray box area gives us the fee distributions because now we're at time t2, we only need to imagine two more blocks. Okay, the state transition tree gives us the probability of two winning. And because now we're at state one one, B is going to just be B U plus delta. And suppose the rational miners are allocating x portion of the mining power to chain one, then delta is just x times beta r, and p is just beta u plus x times beta r. Okay? So here the remaining rational miners can own the first block on chain zero, second block on chain zero, or second block on chain one. Okay, that's where the expected returns come from. So here the quantity in this green box is the expected probability of a rational miners owning the first block on chain zero. But if you can observe who owns it, then you can just use an indicator function, which is what we use in this talk. So what we wanted to do is to solve for the x that maximizes this expected returns. So because this function is linear in x, and then x is going to be either 0 or 1. Okay, so if you are the owner of the first block on chain 0, then you do not shift and stay on chain 0. Otherwise, you are considering shifting. And when a is smaller than 1, then you shift. So the implication for the undercutter is that it needs to let a smaller than 1, and his attacking condition is then gamma smaller than a times beta r plus beta u divided by 1 minus beta u. But uh, here we are just assuming the remaining rational miners are nice and kind. They just let the undercutter do his thing. But in principle, they can undercut the undercutter rate. Right? Okay, so next we'll talk about undercutting avoidance. So what this avoidance technique dictates you to do is when you create a new block, you should claim a is more than this question mark amount of the fees in the bandwidth set. So what this means for the undercutter is that he needs to additionally make a is more than this question mark amount. So what is it? It is just 1 plus gamma hat divided by 1 plus t. So here t is the attacking condition for the strongest undercutter you are defending against. Okay, so for the strongest undercutter in the system, he only needs to defend against the second strongest, and everybody else has to defend against him. So here gamma hat is the v total in the next bandwidth set measured relative to the current bandwidth set. Okay, because we are talking about future undercutting avoidance. And the current bandwidth set is going to be the future block. So the natural question to ask here is why avoid beyond undercut? Why not just let people undercut you? They are not going to succeed with absolute probability. So with some probability, your block is going to be on main chain. So we showed that applying this avoidance technique is actually in actual equilibrium, which means that no players can increase her utility by unilaterally deviating from this defense strategy. Okay. Formally, we state the following. In setting d equals 1, each miner applying avoidance procedure when creating a new block is Nash equilibrium. So we'll provide the proof sketch here, but the intuition is that if the miner does not avoid being undercut, then with some probability, he doesn't, his block becomes stale. And if he does apply avoidance, then he can claim some of the fees and nobody is going to undercut him, and he can claim some remaining of the fees in the future rounds. So here, the important idea is that the decision to apply avoidance is made before one creates a new block. So if you are working with the consensus mechanism that dictates who is going to be the next leader beforehand, then this is going to be a different story. And as we alluded to earlier, because the strongest undercut only needs to defend against the second strongest and everybody else has to defend against him, there will be a 
advantage for the strongest attacker. We capture this by the price of anarchy. So price of anarchy compares the worst case scenario to the best case scenario. So the worst case for us here is that when somebody starts on cutting and everybody starts to apply avoidance. And the optimal case is when everybody just stays honest and earns their fair shares. Okay, so we'll just look at the example at the end. So suppose the strongest undercut has 49.9% mining power, and the second strongest undercut has 70.6% mining power. On average, over the honest mining power, we can calculate the proof price of energy to be 1.29. This means that on average, the 49.9 undercut can earn 63% of the shares when everybody is applying avoidance in equilibrium. I also want to note that there may exist other differences. Like first, we can have a new transaction remodel with knowledge from mechanism design space, but this will definitely impose more changes. And second, we can enforce some transaction selection rules so that the undercutter cannot do what he wishes. Third, we can identify and punish undercutting nodes because undercutting is actually easy to spot. Now let's look at the experiment results. So the figures here shows you the percentage of transaction fees earned by the strongest undercutter. And figure one shows the strongest undercutter having 70.6% mining power. And figure two shows the hypothetical 49.9% undercutter. In both cases, the second strongest undercutter has 70.6% mining power. Okay, so here the blue lines are for the equals one case, which we discussed earlier. And the red lines are for the equals two case. The solid lines are for avoidance case and the dotted lines are for no avoidance case. So we can make several observations here. First, holding on longer means tighter attack conditions and usually less profits. So you can, as you can see, the red lines are usually under the blue lines. Second, avoidance doesn't always make the situation for the undercutter worse because as you can see in the hypothetical 49.9% undercutter case, the in equals one case, the blue dotted line is actually under the blue solid line. This is because the undercutting is not implemented ideally. As we mentioned, if the undercutter predicts future events better, they can do better. So comparing these two figures, we can say that a relatively weak attacker may not implement undercutting well because of the tighter attack conditions and higher sensitivity to like, penny transactions or changes. So the strongest attacker has little advantage in equilibrium because as you can see, they earn about fair shares. A relatively strong attacker can expect to earn extra profits and they have an advantage in equilibrium. As you can see, the dotted lines are above the fair share 50%. Figure 3 has a similar configuration as figure 2, but now we're using artificial transactions with normally distributed ferrets. We can just focus on decals 1 case here because in decals 2 case they don't attack much. As we can see, the dotted lines are now slightly above the solid line. So normally distributed ferrets facilitate on the implementation. So figure 4 shows the results for Monero 35% undercutter. The second strongest undercutter has 29% mining power. Compared with Bitcoin results, we can see that the blockchains with smaller penny transaction set like Monero are easier to attack because of the less uncertainty in future transactions. And a relatively weak attacker does not have a large advantage in equilibrium. So in conclusion, if there are limited amount of fees left, then the undercutter can take the bandwidth set. If there are sufficient amount of fees left, then the undercutter needs to decide the amount of fees to take in the first block wisely. I, we didn't mention the edge case in the talk. So if there are few fees left for a very long time, then miners can start rearranging history. For question four, we do provide an undercutting avoidance technique, but um, if the discrepancy between the mining power of the strongest and the second strongest mining miners are large, then this advantage is going to be carried over to the equilibrium. Okay, so here are some actual notes. First, undercutting may shrink its own profitability if it changes users' behaviors. So for example, if I'm a user, I attach high fee rates to my transactions to get it processed faster, but because of undercutting, it even, they eventually end up in later blocks, then I might not be incentivized to attach higher fee rates, okay? Uh, second, undercutting pattern is easy to distinguish from normal mining. So thank you for your attention, and if you should have any questions, please let me know by email or any other probable methods.